and a very big welcome to Mrs. Hubble and Mrs. Holtman who are watching in Kelham High. It's fantastic to have you on board. Wonderful to hear from you. And I really look forward to sharing the next few moments of our live safari experience with you. And forgive me for I am distracted in terms of looking for these lions. They escaped me this morning. Well, no, they didn't. We saw them this morning. And they escaped me briefly after that. I just want to double check really carefully around in this area under the shade because that of course is where the lions shall be at this time of day. It's very very warm this afternoon. Is that a lion or is it a log? It's a log. It is definitely a log. You are absolutely right. That is 100% a log. And welcome to Abu Sheikh. It's wonderful to have you on board. You wanted to know how many prides of lions we have in this area. Now, the answer to that is we actually follow two prides mainly. Those are the ones we see on a regular basis, along with a dominant male lion coalition that are called the Birmingham Boys, or nicknamed the Birmingham Boys. Then we also get another pride called the Salalas, the Salala Breakaways, which are also known as the Mangani Pride. Sorry everybody, I do have to get onto the Game Drive channel in order to speak to everybody, or try to. Let's just try and get off-road. As soon as I've got a moment to spare on the Game Drive channel, then we'll be able to chat to the guys. Well done, Jandre. So for new viewers who are watching us drive over the trees in this area, we are very, very particular about which trees we drive over. We choose the species very carefully and we choose the young saplings that will spring up behind us. And we do that so that we don't have any kind of major impact on the area around us. And I mean, in terms of us off-roading, you can imagine what kind of effect an entire elephant herd has in this sort of context. Uh, this, what we do in terms of our off-roading is not nearly the same effect, but we are very, very careful about what we do. And we wouldn't, for example, drive over a young Tamburti tree. And this is where the lions, I think, were. Watch out there. Well, the wonderful news is it's not just me out here and while I'm looking for these lions I'm going to send you over to Brent to find out how his journey to Cheetah Plains has worked out. A welcome uh, to Mrs. Altman and Mrs. Hubble and Clennon High School in Virginia Beach and we're in the middle of the African bush on a live African safari and Jamie's out looking for lions. I've come down to the eastern part of our traverse area and I'm hoping uh, for some elephants and maybe even some cheetah. There's some big open plains in this area. But the wonderful thing about being in the bush, it's not always about the big hairies and scaries. There are lots of little fascinating plants and bugs and birds out here for us to have a look at. We're on our way at the moment towards one of the prominent water holes here in the eastern, northeastern Sabi Sands. And uh, fingers crossed, we're gonna find some animals there. So it seems like quite a few of them are wondering what the weather's like here out uh, in Juma. It is beautiful at the moment, it's about 27 degrees uh, Celsius, 78 Fahrenheit. And this is winter, the middle of winter. Now the morning wasn't so warm and it was about 45 Fahrenheit. Uh, so it was a chilly start to the day for us, but that's quite common in the, the temperature around here. Uh, that it starts off cold, warms up through the day, temperature drops quite quickly again after dark. But uh, it is a quite a wonderful climate if you're not too fond of the cold, which I'm not. And uh, it's a sort of what you would call uh, well, bush felt. Uh, in particular, this is low felt, so we're 
low area between two mountain ranges, the Drakensberg Mountains and the Lobombo Mountains. And that bush that Dave is showing you off to the left there is what you would call mixed broadleafed woodland. So it's a very, very popular sort of woodland species for quite an area for quite a lot of different species. Um, we find all of Africa's big five, uh, including cheetah, wild dog, uh, zebra, wildebeest. And what I'm hoping is we might find some of those creatures here. We did have some unusually unusual winter rainfall a couple of days ago and uh, about 15 mils so the animals are a bit spread out. Now, Melody is wondering what animals do we normally see? Well on a, on a daily basis every day we'll see sort of impala, zebra, uh, wildebeest, elephant, uh, buffalo and then probably five or six times a week just depends. Uh, cats, lions, leopards, hyenas but you must remember this is a completely open system uh, we're part of an eight and a half million acre open system it's a trans frontier park that spans three different countries uh, South Africa oh and there's a beautiful little bird let me just go forward a little bit you got him there Dave on the right hand side of the branch there a beautiful oh off he flies stop where did he land at the back. Let's just try to get another view of him. Uh, okay, you got him there, Dave. So I'm going to put the branch in front of the termite mound. Oh, he's flown up a bit. He's going to land back on the same perch. Uh, down. And there to the left. Uh, the left. There we go. Up. Up. Center frame. There we go. It's a beautiful little insectivorous bird called a bee eater. This one's called a little bee eater. Now they've got that name because when they catch bees, they are very good at beating them against sticks to avoid being stung while they feed off them. So that is a little bee eater. Sorry, Melody, I will get back to your question in a second. I just got distracted by this gorgeous little creature. And they often perch like that uh, in quite open areas. And you will watch. They are very, very carefully checking. Oh, there's another one that went past uh, for any flying insects. So most of their feeding is done, or their catching is done on the wing rather than leaping to something on the ground. So they're incredibly agile. There we go. We'll let the little bee eater continue its perch. Now, always a good spot to look for animals around a water hole, especially during our dry season. Now, Melody. As I was saying, we're part of an eight and a half million acre open system that traverses three different countries, Mozambique, South Africa, and uh, Zimbabwe. It's called the Greater Limpopo Trans Frontier Park. And that area is open for the animals to wander wherever they please. Of course, uh, we're not able to as uh, human boundaries, but human boundaries out here don't apply to the animals. There we go, there's a pile of bones next to us that Dave spotted. Now that's an old lion kill. And uh, that ties in nicely with Octavia's question. How often do we see lions? Well, at the moment we're probably seeing them every day, but they have a territory of about, uh, about 16,000 acres, so they can move in and out. But I'm just going to jump out and show you quickly this buffalo skull. So obviously quite closely related to the cows. You see this is actually a female. I'm gonna bring it this side and have a better look at it. And a really fascinating little process is happening here. So nothing out in the wild goes to waste. So you can even see a lot of this would have been eaten by lions and hyenas. But this bone is just too strong uh, for even a hyena who's got 800 pounds of pressure per square inch when they bite to get into the brain casing. So there's a whole bunch of little insects that are specialized and will climb through the nasal cavity uh, and feed off the brain before it completely decomposes. Now one of the few things uh, that cannot be eaten by most animals, because even the bone eventually be eaten by things like porcupine and stuff, uh, and even chewed by other animals if they feel like they're lacking calcium. 
but keratin or hair which the boss is made out of which is this part my hand is on at the moment the horns and it's really hard now there's only one little insect out here that is able to eat that and this is not that old so there's very few little holes in it just yet there we go so you can see these little holes and then this little cocoons that are, are there now that is from a fish moth so the same moth that gets into your clothes uh, is able to digest keratin and if you find an older buffalo skull or any actually skull for that matter they can be completely covered in these little uh, cocoons these have actually hatched so the, the tops open so the little larvae have eaten as much of this compressed carrot keratin as possible and then they've taken off and have disappeared well let's put this back as you never know there might be some more fish moths in the area looking for a meal uh, But this was killed by our major lion coalition that Jamie was telling you about, called the Birmingham Boys. Uh, there's four of them now, but there were five. And one of them actually got severely injured and died from the injuries from hunting buffalo. So the lions don't always have it their own way. Okay, let's put my ears back in. So nothing happening at three in a row pan. So there is another prominent water point to the east of us. So we're going to keep moving through. So, well, <laughs> uh, thanks to all the teachers who joined us in Virginia Beach. They say thanks very much and well, thanks for joining us. And uh, now you've got to get back to work. That's quite sad. We'd much prefer it if you joined us on Safari Live. It's far more fun than work. Well, it is work for me. But cheers, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Oh, so thanks for bearing with us, everyone. That was a group of headmasters at a conference who are looking at possibly adding Safari Live to their curriculum, I suppose. Mm. That's the right word, curriculum. Uh, hi, Aaron. Aaron says, it's been a while since we've seen the Cheetah Boys. Do you think we'll see them today? I hope so. I'm going to slowly make my way down towards those open plains, and hopefully we'll get some luck there shortly. Okay, so while we head towards those vast open plains, uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Fourth time lucky? Yes, definitely fourth time lucky. We're going to try one more stretch of this road. <laughs> I don't think we're going crazy though. We've now checked, as I said, four times. The, I don't know where this wind has come from. It's now howling across the triple M boundary. These lines, I found the tracks where the lioness came and lay in the road and then I can see where her tracks move towards Juma. And then after that things get a little bit trickier because the sand is quite quite hard at the moment after that rain and I can't see exactly where she stepped through. But I suspect that she was lying on the road, a vehicle came past and basically scared her off a little bit away from where she was initially. That's my suspicion. Because it is a main road and there's lots and lots of vehicle traffic. She might have decided that actually this wasn't such a good place to go and lie down. Let's just check very carefully here because her, her sleeping mark, her sleeping track was just at this termite mound. try and find it for you or at least try and show it to you it's really difficult to see in this light it makes more sense to me that if she was lying on this side of the road she might have pushed in that way but I don't see anything no sleeping lioness her track is here her sleeping track where she was lying down that sort of scuffed area there 
That's where her tail was, and then that flattened area is where her belly was. And then if you look really closely, you'll be able to see the lion track in the middle of that. I'm going to get out to show you what I mean. So far, I've already got out once here, so nothing's growled at me. I think we're fine. Unless she's on the other side of that termite mound, in which case, well, at least we would have found the lions. Are you on the other side of that termite mound? Don't think so. We would have heard it by now. So her track is here. The, this is her paw print. And when you're looking at a flattened patch of ground like that, if you don't immediately recognize what animal it might have been, the best way to look is to look for the track itself in the middle of the sleeping, the flattened track. And now I know her front paws were here. They've been driven over a little bit. But her front paws were here. And her tail was this, is this streak here that's in the ground. So she was facing this direction. And then there's tracks going along here. It gets harder and harder to see them as they start to move on here, but there's one going that way. That's Juma, that's Arethusa. They're somewhere here and their tracks are really, really fresh. Even if I hadn't met that gentleman who was so excited about seeing lions, I still would have known that these are fresh. They've got a crispness to them. The fact that they've survived being on a main road without being driven over means that these lions were right here probably about two seconds before we got here. This temperature on a windy day, it's difficult to say whether or not they're going to keep moving or if they're going to stay where they are. Let's go and investigate. I think we've got enough evidence to say that they're somewhere this side. At least I hope they're somewhere this side. I have checked their last position. There's no evidence of them being anywhere there. But perhaps we find them just here in the shade somewhere. That's the log. That's the same log that tricked me the last time. Not going to make that mistake twice. They might be going for a drink. Possible. Perhaps at Voyatella Dam. Keep your eyes on the Juma Dam camera and see whether or not there's any sign of them coming across in that direction. Come on, lionesses. Playing games with us. And they're most likely south of this road. Haven't seen any tracks crossing. Oh, good place to look. As I said, it's a funny day. With the wind, it's nice and cool. But if you sit stationary in the sun, you find yourself getting very warm very quickly and perhaps they might have decided to go and lie down in the shade somewhere here. It makes you wish you had x-ray vision, be able to look through all of the trees that are in the way. What on earth was that bird? There are a whole load of helmet shrikes and then one yellow bird that looked suspiciously like a... No, surely not. I've lost it now. Oh, there's the red-headed weavers are getting their plumage colors. Much, much clearer now. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Jandre, and I've lost him completely now. There was a bird with a bright red head, but he is... Oh, there he is. He's on top of that um, bush willow. <laughs> This bush willow, this one that I'm pointing, oh, and now he's gone behind there. Um, if we go s zoom in, yeah, that, that bush willow. Yeah. And he's now on the left-hand side. There he's fluttering, and I think he, there he is. Well done, Jandre. <laughs> Bravo to Jandre, who managed to get that bird on camera for those split seconds. Hey, actually, high five, sorry. Woo. Dumped you. Dumped you in some serious mess there. <laughs> there are, I know, this entire area is bush willow. I might as well have said in the tree. In the tree, the one with the leaves. Sorry, Jandre. You did a good job, though, everybody. Bravo to Jandre. Our cameramen do very well with us saying something like that bird over there, and there's about 50 birds in front of them. The one with the feathers. Come on, Jandre. Keep it together. This is so frustrating because I know that these lions are somewhere here.
But where? There's some very, very relaxed looking impala that don't look as though the lions have just walked past them. They're very they're in some very dense vegetation here. Hmm. Hmm. I'm sure they are 50 meters in from the road, flat, lying flat. The only way that we're going to find them, I think, is to go walking. Because otherwise, this is starting to turn into a wild gooch, goose, 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 goose chase. There we go. That was like some kind of scratched record. Goose chase. I haven't walked on this road. We would see it. We would definitely see it. Even with the soil as hard as it is right now, we would see it. Okay. It's such a pity I don't know whether I could trust the the left or the right story of that gentleman that pointed them out to us. I think he got so overly excited and he was traveling towards us and we were traveling towards him. So our left and right would be opposite. And I'm not sure whether he was talking about my, his, his left or my left or my right. So while we try and figure out this puzzle of the lefts and the rights, the Jumas and the Arethusas, let's go over to Brent and find out if things are any simpler on cheetah planes. So we've just arrived on the big open areas of cheetah planes. And I'm now just going to go very slowly. Let's stop for a bit, take out my binoculars, do a quick scan. See if we can spot anything. Hopefully a cheetah lying in the shade somewhere. Okay, so carefully, carefully check how cheetah often Lie, or they lie very flat, they've got a very slim body and they have an incredible way of lying with their head sort of sitting up. They quite often look like a piece of elephant dung from a distance, especially if they're in the shade. Now the one thing I'm going to say is I think cheetah plants, well this area had a lot more rain than we did at Juma. And I'm seeing lots of little patches of water, little pans that have filled up. Standing by, Herbie. Okay, I'm just going very, very slowly. No sign of anything just yet. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that uh, my comms are not working here. I'm going to try and head towards some higher ground. You can see uh, Herbie was trying to call me. Herbert, Herbert. So we left Herbie on foot where Karula was last seen. So Herbie, can you go again with that update, please? Copy, thanks, Herb. So he's found tracks of Karula crossing out of our Travis area, but she doesn't have the cubs with her. So the cubs could still be somewhere around there. So Herbie's going to go take a walk there. We're going to go check towards a cheetah plane's pan. 
hopefully we'll get some luck around there. But it does look like they had a lot more rain in this area. But hopefully, oh, what do we have here? No, hyena tracks, not cheetah tracks. I'm just going to do a quick check of the northern boundary of Cheetah Plains and hopefully we might find some sign of Mr. Q. Uh, Quarantine is a young male leopard who's trying to establish himself in this area and he's a firm favourite of a lot of ours and definitely one of my favourite leopards uh, that we see on Cheetah Plains. Okay, um, as I said, I'm having a bit of problems with my comms at the moment, so I can't actually hear what Final Control is saying at all. So I'm going to try to start moving a little bit further to the west. And we're going to check here, there doesn't seem to be much out on the open plains today. And that could have been because they've had a bit more rain in this area and the animals have spread out. around but no sign of any creatures now it's not to say that there aren't any animals here but after the rain the tracking is quite difficult uh, so hopefully we've got a little bit of luck. We're just going to check around the northern boundary. If we get nothing there, uh, I think we might skedaddle back towards uh, Juma. Maybe go give Herbie a hand looking for those leopard cubs. And while we're on our way, there's lots of wonderful little creatures to see. You got it? Oh, got him. In the, oh, gone. There was a little scrub robin. There are some other birds here. Let me just go forward a bit. You got them? Top of the tree? There we go. There's some to get the birders' brains going. Some little LBJs. Now, I wonder if anyone out there knows the name of those LBJs. So grab a screenshot, get your bird book, see if you can figure out what little LBJ those two are. And notice the slightly more reddish crown on top of its head. That's one of the indicators of the species. Now, if you know what LBJ this is, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Well, those little LBJs were being quite nice. Normally they don't sit around that long, so hopefully you've got a screenshot and you've got a bird book and you can figure it out while I try and make my way towards an area where my comms start working. Another big open area coming up. If we get nothing on this open area, let's go north. Sorry guys, 
I'm just getting something on the radio here. Mike, confirm what was crossing into Voyatella? Sorry, guys. Copy, thanks. So it sounds like there's lion tracks coming back into Juma. And I'm sure Jamie's on top of those. Uh, I think it's looking a bit quiet down here on Cheetah Plains. And I think with that extra rain, the animals would have spread. So I'm just want to check along the northern boundary here for any sign of Mr. Q. Um, sorry, on the radio again. Ah, oh, there we go. Herbie's doing it for me. Okay, so while I try to get to some better comms, I think I just made it out that we're going to go back and see what Jamie's up to. Oh well, Brent does whatever it is he's up to on Cheetah Plains. We are still looking for these lions because it is now a matter that I am absolutely determined to solve this mystery. The knowledge that we just, just missed out on seeing them I find quite frustrating. I just see a very big puddle off into the block, which is good. That means they're not going to go all the way to Voyatella Dam to go and have a drink. They're going to stick around here if that's what they're looking for. Maybe they were hunting. Maybe they were hunting those impala that I said looked so relaxed. Perhaps that's why the, the impala looked so relaxed. You never know. Yes, exactly. Um, well, just enjoying the moment spent without the knowledge. It's not the line you see that gets you, I suppose. But they're here somewhere. They haven't gone, they can't have gone that far. They wouldn't surely have gone that far in this heat. They weren't that hungry this morning. They were, Amber Eyes was looking a little bit like she could use a meal, but the others were fine. They were still relatively round-bellied. They've just finished off a buffalo in the last two days. And they're not that hungry. They're not hungry enough to push constantly to try and find food. Which leads me to the conclusion that they're, they're here somewhere and not far away from where we are. Okay, one last loop, but in an opposite direction. Maybe they're going, decided to go further to the south. I found one track which, you know, it speaks volumes. I found one footprint, and it's... I can't decide if it's not from this morning, when they were... perhaps when they moved through this area, they were playing with each other before they crossed into Arethusa. I'm just trying to communicate something on the Game Drive channel because Taxon is asking about these lions. I'm just waiting for the conversation to finish. I'm trying to at least. Tax, tax. Our tax, it looks as if they crossed just south of the power lines. Um, one of the guys that I bumped into on Triple M saw them. I'm trying to follow up on Impala Road now, but I don't think they've gone too far into this block. They're just getting, just giving tax that update about the fact that they have crossed
Oh, okay, copy that. Thank you. All right, everybody keep your eyes peeled. If I were the lions, I would pop out somewhere here. There's plenty of food on these open areas usually. And there's also lots of shade, lots of cover, and at the same time, nice open areas for them to look across and look for something to hunt. They've got, they've, they're somewhere here. They're in this drainage system. They haven't moved far. Come on, lions. Oh, this is so frustrating. You get to the point where you've just spent, because we spent two hours this morning tracking them, they crossed, and as they crossed, everybody jumped on board to want to go and see them, and we weren't able to join the queue. And now, this afternoon, they're somewhere here. There's the Impala. They're far away, but they're looking very happy with life. They don't look like a lion has just walked through. Looking very, very calm. No glancing off in a different direction. We've spoken before about the fact that potential prey species are usually quite relaxed in the presence of a predator, provided they can see that predator and they can watch what it's doing. That's what lulls them into that sense of security. And strangely enough, it's not unheard of for lions to actually capitalize on that entire process and what I mean by that is lions have been known to fake sleep pretend to be sleeping to lull the animals into a false sense of security all the while with another lioness or lion waiting in the wings to catch the animals or to chase the antelope towards that other lion so that's just an interesting thing I didn't realize that lions did until relatively recently but it's a clever technique if the animals think that they are safe because they can see the lions might be worth thinking twice before they go making any mad rushes off in any direction. <sighs> They're not here either. They've got to, got to be just off the road. I think it's so hard with the with the soil being as hard as it is right now it's almost unless you walk along the road unless you walk along each and every road you've got a very very good chance of missing tracks coming across Check here too carefully, and there's lots of water here. They might have come to decide to have a drink at these mud wallows. It's the first time I've seen water in here in a very, very long time. Perhaps they crossed in somewhere here and decided to come for a drink. <laughs> so frustrating, I can see the other road. They've got to be between this road and that road. They, they have to be. We can't have missed them by that much. Okay. The only way we're going to solve this is to go for a walk. That's going to be the only way we're going to find them. They've got to be in here somewhere. Unless there's a couple of them marching back to wherever it is that they've hidden their cubs at the moment. Because this morning when we saw them, we had all five in Kahumas with us, but no cubs. So all three sets had been left somewhere, not to fend for themselves exactly, but they'd been left somewhere to wait for mom to return. And perhaps the three of them, the three lionesses, have gone on a mission back to find them. Because we've only really got tracks for three lionesses coming back across. 
that we can confirm. But then again, as I said, it's a main road. Somebody could have driven over the fourth and fifth set remarkably easily. Fifth time lucky? No, I'm going to get into trouble if I do that. No. <laughs> we can't drive triple M for a fifth time. We really can't. I'll have to drive and then walk it. We got it. Ah, oh, I thought Jandre made an exclamation as if he'd just found the lions. I thought he'd got them. I was about to rejoice. Well, we'll just expand our search a little bit farther afield. We'll check Zoe's road. Our stations, I can't find any sign of them crossing Impala Road. I might have missed it, but I can't see any sign of them coming through. Hmm. If they were coming back, where would they go? Where have they hidden those cubs? I'm pretty certain that some of the cubs have been left in that drainage area around Galago Pan. Uh, they might be somewhere around there. Sorry, Orbs, I couldn't copy that at all. Okay, copy. Thanks, Aubrey. And absolutely, Tasha Michelle. Sorry, that was the whole the whole process behind using that game drive channel was in fact in so that I can hear whether or not the other reserves have found them. So they all work off one channel in certain areas. So we've got our northern channel, we've got our western channel and our eastern channel. And it just depends upon where we are that we listen to them, or which channel we listen to. And the other guides will absolutely keep us updated. So they're all aware that we are looking for these lions and that we are casting about to see if we can't spot them somewhere on Juma. So if, they, if per chance they'd crossed back, say, further to the north, and then any of the guys at Simbambili or Arethusa, they would let us know and just tell them, okay, guys, we found all five of them, so you don't need to worry about looking any further. Oh, just something really useful that we do, and there's a, a great sense of helping each other out in that sense, because we've all been there, especially for some of them where they've got guests there for their last day, desperate to see a leopard, and we'll help them out, or vice versa. So there's a great spirit of camaraderie and a great knocking from Wendy's front right wheel that shouldn't be there. That's new, anyway. I'm sure Wendy's absolutely fine. But I will be listening, Tasha Michelle, and I will keep you updated about whether or not those lions are found. It's entirely possible that they could have just done a little loop and gone back. Maybe they got nervous because there was a helicopter or something and they just moved back onto the property. And then it's really useful to have different eyes and ears on the ground in different areas. George H. George H is thinking about what I would love to happen right now, which is how often when we are tracking an animal does it appear around the bend in the road uh, while we're tracking it. Sure, it depends. Most of the time we'll be able to tell you with a certain degree, if not accuracy, then we'll be able to tell you these tracks are fresh versus these tracks are a couple of hours old. When we say these tracks are fresh, I would say that maybe 25% of the time when you're driving along and you go around the corner that animal is still there on the road 
Uh, most of the time the animals have moved off and it takes a little bit more in the way of searching or the animal just pops out where you didn't expect to see it at all and it's just walking towards the road as you happen to drive around the corner. So there's lots of luck involved as well. There's skill, there's a combination of skill and luck in working and well just in driving around out here in general. Oh, something doesn't sound good in Wendy. Trying to show you a lilac breasted roller, but it is playing hard to get. I also want to know where all the elephants have gone. It felt like over the last three days you couldn't go around a corner without meeting an elephant, and now all of a sudden they all seem to have vanished off into the bush making life relatively difficult. Just bear with me, every now and again I'm going silent so that I can listen to the Game Drive channel. It seems as though Rusty is experiencing some problems. So Brent is on his way back towards Juma. Not sure exactly what's going on there. I just want to test something on Wendy, sorry. As we're going along, I just want to see where the bump is. Yeah, steering bar. It's on the left hand turn, left side turn. All right, well, I get out and have a look at what's coming loose in Wendy. Let's go back over to Brent, who does seem to have picture and signal, and find out how his trip back from Cheetah Plains is going. So we are back from Cheetah Plains. Uh, we're in this area where Herbie is checking for the Karula's cubs. And he just let me know that there was a big elephant bull that crossed around here. So we're going to see if we can catch up with that elephant bull. And he did find tracks of Karula crossing out, but further down the road. And those weren't there this morning, so she must have just been playing give Brent the slip this morning. So we're going to see if we can catch up with that Ellie. I'm hoping it's a big bull. I haven't seen a nice really big elephant bull in a while. from Herbie which way it went. Maybe it's having a mud bath in the water hole. Herbie, Herbie. Herb, which way did that one and only lower famba? Copy, heading straight north. Okay, heading straight north, so we're going to do the same. Okay, so Yobi says her tracks came back north. Hmm. Hello Isabella. Isabella's five years old and Isabella wants to know whether I think that the elephants chased the baby lions away and that's why they're hiding now. Now Isabella, that could very easily happen. Uh, elephants often chase, oh hello little Franklin. That's a Natal Franklin. We've seen the crested. This is the second more common species we get here. Isabella, I'll be back to your question in a second. They're actually quite pretty birds and when you look closely, such intricate patterns on their feathers. <laughs> Digging around, looking for grass seeds that might have been washed down in the riverbed or any insects hiding in the leaf litter. 
Now, that is a female. A male will be around. And the reason I know it's a female is if we look at its feet. So, wait for it to move. There's a small spur, uh, sort of very similar to what you get on chickens, on the back side of the feet that the males use for fighting. Now, on the females, it's quite a lot smaller. The males have massive spurs. Foraging away. What you found in there, Franklin? Oh, no, oh, 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 oh. There we go. Looking, keep moving down the riverbed. We're going to do the same. So, if the tracks are coming back to the north, I want to just have a quick look where we had those leopard cubs yesterday. They might have just been hiding in a little thicket this morning. So, Isabella, elephants often chase uh, lions and lion cubs. So maybe that lions bumped into some elephants today and they chased them. I just want to check in these thickets here. Not a good place for a little leopard cub to hide. Lots of really good spots for little leopards to hide in. Okay, so whenever. Okay, so this is where they were yes yesterday, so I just want to check carefully up on the steep bank. Is worth double checking. But always worth a check. But no sign of those little horrors. Hopefully Herbie has some success on foot. some answers in for the bird quiz. A helmeted shrike and a red crowned lapwing. I don't even think there is such a bird as a red crowned lapwing, uh, but nope, I think you guys are still going to have to figure that one out. Back to the bird books. Well done to Joanne and James. Uh, that is spot on. It is a rattling cysticula. That little red cap is one of the giveaways. Okay, so I'm going to head further now to the west and see what we can find in that area. Okay, so Liz uh, said, Franklin, remind her of quails, and uh, do we get any quails in this area? Uh, we do, Liz, but they prefer the grassy areas, and uh, Franklin are quite a lot bigger than quails. If I had to describe them to a northern hemisphere bird, probably grouse is the closest uh, thing you can describe them to. 
Uh, we get button quails, which are tiny, tiny little things. And then we get common quail and blue quail. But again, they prefer more grassy areas. It is possible in a really wet year that they might migrate through and, and, and be in the Sabi Sands, in this area of the Sabi Sands. But generally, I've seen quails uh, a lot further to the south. Okay, while we head towards the west, I'm gonna go give Jamie and Aubrey a hand trying to figure out where the lions went. Uh, let's go see how Jamie's lion hunt is going. It is wonderful news to hear that Brent is on his way to give us a hand. We have scoured the whole of the western edge of Juma and I'm now going to go towards Arethusa and just double check that perhaps they're not hiding on there somewhere. But for now we've just moved a little bit further, farther afield in order to see whether or not there are any animals hiding about and whether or not the animals decided to come in this direction. It doesn't seem as though that is the case though. They're all hiding away. Jandro made a very valid point because we were questioning where all our antelope and zebra and things are. Jandro's point was, well, we did spend the morning here with both wild dogs and lions in exactly the same place. I'm not sure if that's why they're hiding out. I also think that there might be the water option, the fact that there is so much groundwater around, meaning that they are a little bit more dispersed than they might otherwise have been. But we are going back to where we had those last tracks of the lions. I did want to go and get out and hop out and go for a little bit of a wander around. Now let's head back and we can do that all together. The knocking on Wendy, by the way, I'm not 100% sure, but it doesn't sound ideal. Anyway, I think that it is, it'll be just fine. Natasha Michelle, apart from Herbie, you want to know whether or not we have anybody out on foot helping us out. And Tasha Michelle, we do, we do we do sort of. Now usually when there are three of us on the ground, when it's James, Brent and myself and with Steph around as well, we can often send out one of us on tracking team to go for a little bit of a walk, have a nice peaceful bush experience on foot and at the same time help the two other guides out in terms of tracking. But there's also all of the trackers that sit on the front of the vehicles, both for the Juba vehicles, for the Cheetah Plains vehicles. A lot of the, the various lodges have trackers that sit on the front and whenever they pick up fresh, fresh tracks then they will just jump off and go. And they carry a handheld radio that they then will call in if they've found the animal or not. And then the guide, what the guide usually does is skips ahead several steps and then calls the tracker if they find tracks crossing the road whilst the tracker's busy walking. And these trackers are truly amazing people. They can see things that it would take a very firm stretch of one's imagination to believe that you had seen in the sand. Hello, Zebra. Nice to see you. Having just said that there were no Zebra around, here we have two of them. Two stallions, I think. Hello, boys. Munching away on whatever's left of the grass. And to be 100% honest with you, there's not terribly much left. But at least they too will be rejoicing in the fact that we have had a little bit of rain to make our lives slightly easier. Look at them. They truly are some of the most photogenic animals. They are so... These boys are particularly in good condition. You can see their coats gleaming in the afternoon sun. Flicking their heads to keep the flies away. And this boy giving us a nice way of telling the difference between a male and a female because you can actually really see how thin that stripe is underneath his tail. It's one of the hardest things to do for first timers or first time visitors to the bush is identify the difference between a male and a female zebra. It's not always as clear as you might think and that is the best way of doing it. In the females that black stripe is much much thicker. 
Now these are plains zebra, also known as, or they were known as Birchall's zebra, and I have to be honest, to me they probably will always be, or well, I will always think of them as Birchall's zebra. That was the name that they were called when I was a child. That name has since been changed to plains zebra. Obviously Birchall, I don't know his exact history, but I'm going to assume, given that there's also Birchall's kukul, Birchall's starling, that he was a biologist of sorts. Tail swishing from side to side. And let's go forward a little bit and just get a nice different view of them. And while we do, I spoke about them being plain zebra, but Leanne wanted to know whether there are any subspecies of zebra. And Leanne, absolutely there are subspecies of zebras. Strangely enough, there aren't any that are still living. But I don't know, Leanne, if you've ever heard of an animal called the quacha. Our genetic testing done on quacha's remains, because unfortunately as human beings, they were one of the animals that we killed off very early on in the arrival in Africa of the sort of western colonies. So the quacha was made extinct. It is an animal that doesn't, it's a sort of a half zebra, half horse, or at least that is how it was described. What we now know through DNA testing is that it was a subspecies of the plains of the Birchall zebra. And interestingly enough, there is a project in the Western Cape that is looking to recreate the quagga. And that's spelled Q... I think it doesn't have a U. I think it's Q-A-G-G-A, -G -G -A, quagga. And they're looking basically through selective breeding because what it seems as though is that a population of plain zebra at some point many thousands of years ago became isolated in some way, probably geographically, perhaps due to a flood or a change in the river systems. And through breeding they created this strange half-horse looking creature. And you'll see it with some of our virtual zebra or our plain zebra. Next time we stop at a zebra, have a look at the stripe patterns because some of them have stripes that extend all the way across their rump and, the, and most of the time zebra look like this but there are some individuals where the stripes are much much fainter around certain parts of their body and for better or for worse certain scientists have been trying to take those zebra with the sort of faint stripes around the rump and slowly breed away the stripes in the rear end and they've got to the point where they now have a blank bottomed zebra without any stripes. Their next step is to try and inject certain levels of brown into that coat. So weird, really interesting subspecies of plain zebra. Then of course you get the mountain zebra and the grevy zebra. We don't have any grevies or mountain in this area. Mount grevy zebra up towards eastern Africa. And the Cape Mountain, an endangered species that you will find in the Cape area. You know, because in case Cape Mountain Zebra didn't give that away. And the stripes of a Cape Mountain Zebra don't extend all the way down to the center of the animal's belly. They don't meet in the middle like they do in our plain zebra. Slightly shorter, not quite as stocky as our Birchall's or our plain zebra. You see, I can't, I can't call these animals plain zebra without mentioning them as Birchall's zebra. I struggle. It's one of those name changes that I really struggle with. Now truly lovely animals, and there's this animal that makes for some really spectacular photographs. There we go, giving a demonstration as to giving us a demonstration as to just how well the stripes work in terms of breaking up the outline of the animal. Because imagine you didn't have a camera zoomed in and looking at them. Jandre gave us a really nice idea there with the focus, but look at that. So we're looking at it through the eyes of the camera. Now imagine you're looking at it uh, through the eyes of a predator that doesn't even see colour as well as we do. Yes, they're certainly geared towards movement, but picking out where an individual zebra starts and finishes might make that split-second difference that in turn will mean success or failure of a hunting mission. And speaking of success or failure as of a hunting mission, we're going that way and we are going to go and find those lions because I refuse to not find those lions.
I know that they're there somewhere. And I agree, Roger. They are too relaxed for there to be lions around. That's because we've moved our search a little bit further, further afield, and there's definitely no lions around here on this road. So what we do now is we drive all the way back, and we're going to go and find those lions. I have absolutely no doubt that they're around and the clock is ticking because as it starts to get darker and cooler those lions are going to get up and move around and the question is where are they going to move to I'm sure that three of the five of them have cubs to feed so they're gonna have to head back I can almost guarantee at least two of the sets are on Juma so two sets of cubs are somewhere here and generally they won't leave their cubs much more than 24 hours before they go back and feed them. Not quite like a leopard. I know that Brent was talking about finding Karula's cubs. And I also know that he is, at the moment, sort of triple, if I know Brent as well as I do, um, he's going to be triple checking really carefully on his way to the west to make sure that there's no sign of them because he knew he had them yesterday and they've got to still be in this area. So a leopard will leave their cubs a little bit longer than a lion will. Oh, this wind. zebra. So my statement earlier about there being no zebra around has just proven to be completely inaccurate. They're all here. And there's a very tiny little foal with them. Let's see if they'll let us get a bit closer. What's she doing? Pulling funny faces. Let's just have a look. Before I go too much closer, I just want to see why she's staring as intently as she is, first of all. And also, she was making a funny face. She stopped it now. Ah. No, she's still looking very intently off in that direction. What's up, girl? What have you seen? Again, the wind is starting to... Look at that. What's going on? Maybe just a burr caught in her lip. Or, zebra have some kind of secret language that we are only just now seeing evidence of. Because that looks like she's signaling to another zebra. What is that about? Might just be something uncomfortable caught in her lip or in her teeth. You see the way her top lip is moving like that? And she is still staring off intently. Now her little one's doing it. Now the foal's doing it. Those of you who are familiar with horses, is there something really um, obvious that I'm missing? Is this a, a sort of a common occurrence that horses do? Because of course zebra are relatively similar to horses. Now she's running. What's going on? What on earth? I'm just stopping. I'm settling far from them because I just want to try and work out what is going on or what is happening. They seem... Oh, she's snorting now. Oh, there's got to be something here. And see the way the little foal's legs are splayed? Like it's, it's run and then it's stopped because it's not quite sure which direction to run in. What if she smelt something? No, she's talking to other zebra. I can hear other zebra snorting off to the right of me. 
Did she get separated, maybe, from the rest of the group? It's a mystery. The fall's also doing it. Maybe it's just the response in wind. Now, the reason I ask some of you if you are more familiar than I am with horses, perhaps this isn't a reaction to the wind in some way. That sort of lifting of the top lip. I don't know. Um, let's go a little bit closer. There's another zebra that's just popped out. I can hear zebras snorting off to the right here. And immediately it makes me wonder about those lionesses. Because I didn't think they'd come this far south. But who knows, maybe that's exactly what they decided to do. What's happening, Zebra? Terry Steele has said it's, it looks like nickering, like the horse, like horses do, sort of talking to each other. Terry, that was my first thought as well, except that she initially she wasn't making any sounds that I could hear. It was only at the end that she started snorting, but maybe with the wind blowing I couldn't hear exactly what she was doing. Maybe that's exactly what it was, little gentle nickering sounds. Rogers said perhaps challenging another zebra. Well, they are aggressive animals, and she's still doing it. So perhaps that is, perhaps it is some sort of a display to the rest of the zebra in the herd. I really don't know. I am stumped. Maybe nickering is what they're doing and we just can't hear it from where we are. There's zebra everywhere here. Some interesting things happening with their dynamics because there's a zebra over there that is intently watching what is going on. Hmm. And Lorena, that's also a really, really good idea that perhaps that movement with her mouth is helping her smell the air, kind of like a phlegm and grimace, just not as pr pronounced. So the organ of Jacobson that sits in the roof of their mouth is an organ that is used as a sense of smell. But perhaps that is what is causing that fascinating behavior. Maybe trying to lift the scent in. Oh, hold on, sorry. I think Tex is trying to call me. Uh, standing by. Maybe he wasn't trying to call me. Hmm. Disappointed. Ah. Oh. All watching this other zebra move past. Maybe this, this to me looks internal, or at least into zebra, if that makes any sense. It does look like some kind of communication between different zebra. Perhaps the harem has found itself separate from the stallion a little bit, or perhaps there is that bachelor herd that we saw earlier. Still doing it. Or is it flies? Is it just as simple as that? Because I can't hear a sound, but at the same time, I'm not very close because I don't want to scare them and to stop this behavior. I want to watch what they're up to. Maybe nickering is exactly what they're doing. I really honestly don't know. But it's fascinating. And it seems to be connected to that one individual. Okay. Let's go a bit closer now that we can.
they all seem to be contented to move away from this area now. I think it was connected to that individual that was walking down the road. But I don't know exactly what it might be. So, to change subject ever so slightly, back to, ta back to the conversation about their names, Taylor's question is, well, who gets to decide what the animals are called? It's a very, very valid point, and usually it will be, if, you, if a name is changed, because of course most of our animals at this point have, have a name already, if it's a, a name that needs to be changed, then, then it will be a biologist that will be a researcher into the, probably into the evolutionary background of the zebra or something similar, and they will put forward a proposal to change the name in a form of a scientific article that will then either be met with resounding applause or with disagreement from the various scientific groups. And as is the way of things, it'll probably take a long time before the name is actually officially changed, but it does get officially changed by the scientists. I don't actually know what organization would be responsible for labeling the animals or for labeling an animal change. However, when it comes to naming new species, species that we've never seen before, and of course they've just discovered a new species of dolphin, I read an article about, oh, sorry, a whale, it was a whale, different species of beaked whale, very, very recently, and it's something that a lot of people are incredibly excited about. The person who is responsible for discovering that or doing plenty of research into it initially will usually get the honor of naming that particular animal. And at this point, they try and name them after whatever sort of characteristics are unifying. We're going to leave our zebra now because they seem to have stopped their peculiar behavior and are moving off. I think I'm going to go with nickering in terms of the behavior that we've seen. I'm not 100% sure. Perhaps they are talking to each other. We just can't hear the sound because the wind is blowing. I've just never heard them do that with such regularity but or so repeatedly. But it is interesting. Okay, back to those lion tracks. Let's go and find them. Getting ridiculous now. I really, really want to find them for you this morning. This aren't bad. This afternoon. It's not morning. It's our definitely, definitely afternoon. And has clearly, <laughs> perhaps a little bit of extra sleep might be called for. Now talking about the creation of the quacha and bringing back the quacha has led Harry to ask about my opinion on the woolly mammoth or the sort of the idea of bringing back the woolly mammoth as a species through DNA manipulation. Harry, it's a really difficult one because there is a part of me, there's a little the little girl that's fascinated by all kinds of things and probably that harks back to the idea of Jurassic Park, although of course Jurassic Park went horribly wrong for them and isn't something to base a firm opinion upon. But I think the little girl part of me thinks it would be amazingly fascinating to see an animal like that. The other part of me, that the part that's come to know and love elephants and got to know elephants as wild animals, I feel as though it would be the saddest thing imaginable to create a little woolly mammoth with no family of its own. It would, I mean, I assume they'd have to raise it through, raise it, they'd have to surrogate it with an African elephant or something similar in order to create it. But to me, those natural instincts that must be there, and we know now that elephants are very, very intelligent animals, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if the woolly mammoth isn't also, wasn't also quite an intelligent species. And whilst we've been responsible for, we were a large part responsible for wiping them out, or we played a role at least, I don't know that that gives us the, the go-ahead to bring them back. 
Because just imagine this poor little woolly mammoth growing up. I mean, we wouldn't create a whole herd of woolly mammoth because I suppose we could. And then what? They've got no wild areas to go into. They'd be constantly tested and monitored and I don't know. There's something that I think maybe I would have answered you differently 15 years ago. But now spending time getting to know African elephants, I think I'd say no, because I think it would be tremendously unfair for the animal that you create to, to sort of compete against those instincts. But that being said, there's a scientific part of my brain that would be absolutely fascinated by the process and the outcomes and, and seeing just how close their behavior might be to elephants. But I, I don't think that justifies it. So my argument lies purely in terms of the well-being of the animal that they create. It's one thing cloning a sheep, where it can go with other sheep and do sheepy things, but a woolly mammoth is an entirely different kettle of fish. And dinosaurs, on the other hand, I'm all for. We could have some amazing time with dinosaurs because it went really well. In, if Jurassic Park has taught me anything, it's that we should bring back dinosaurs. Speaking of Jurassic Park and elephants, all of the sound effects in those films, the noises of the Tyrannosaurus rex and many of the other dinosaurs were made by elephants. Re recording of elephant vocalizations. Just a random aside on that. And the motion of the T-Rex's legs was, mo was modeled on a guinea fowl running. So tiny little snippets of, inf snippets of information. Okay, back, back to where these lions have to be. They've got to be here. They can't have gone that far, surely. The question about the woolly mammoth, because obviously I'm now driving along thinking about that, also brings us to the next, the next question in terms of human interference. There's a lot of biologists that say that the cheetah is a, an animal, an animal species that is going naturally extinct. It over-specialized and is no longer successful as a species. It's being out-competed by the other big predators and that we shouldn't necessarily concentrate on trying to save them through breeding projects and through breeding centers. So artificially looking after cheetah and recreating that population because it's a species that was going to go extinct anyway. And it sort of plays that out from a different side of the coin. It's interfering where to save a species rather than to bring it back. Now, it's a difficult one. I, I argue, my argument would be that the Cheetah may well be a naturally disappearing species, but at the same time, how on earth do we determine what effects is, are natural in terms of population loss and what are caused by human encroachment? Because we know we have a profound, as a species, we have a profound effect in terms of the habitat loss on the numbers of all animals. So how do we know where human effect begins and ends and where natural effect starts up and creates that loss of cheetah life. It's just an interesting thought because I have heard people argue for essentially instead of putting the money before that's I mean that does sound heartless but I have heard people argue towards instead of putting the money that's put into conservation of cheetah and the breeding of cheetah they argue towards trying to put it into another more productive, what they would call more productive method of conservation. Now, there is an argument to it. I disagree with it, so, uh, sort of. 
again, breeding centres, you've got to be very, very careful that they're actually doing the true conservation work that they claim to be doing. But it is a thought. Do we owe it to the cheetah to try and step in and save them? Or do we just conserve them as we conserve any other animal? And if they die out, that's a very difficult one. Because cheetah need enormous areas, and we're responsible for the fact that they can't have vast areas of territory or home ranges. And so we can't, they, don't, they aren't able to move into places where there's less of a concentration of lions, for example. marvelous news I'm sure that Brent is absolutely dying during his extended absence to give you an update as to what he's been up to I've heard some exciting things on the game drive channel but I'm not going to reveal any of his secrets I'm going to let him chat to you himself okay guys sorry I'm just really busy at the moment but quite exciting I'll be with you in a second Herb, uh, confirm what you got there. Kobe, do you still think I should do that Skabanga and Lala? Kobe, thanks. Okay, so. Queen Karula is up to her normal antics. She has walked over our tracks twice today. So we've gone past and, and who knows when she has wandered with both cubs behind us. Not once, but twice. So we're on hot on Queen Karula's trail at the moment. So um, we're checking myself, Aubrey, Taxon, Herbie's on foot. So we're gonna see if we have any luck. I didn't take uh, Chelepan. I'm gonna go take Skabenga Lela. But she's top of my Konzo twice today. Okay, so we're gonna keep hunting for this leopard now. And the fact that she's fetched the cubs, the cub tracks are with her, means she's probably got a kill somewhere close by. Give my head, it's going to be leaning off the side while I try make sure we don't miss okay, she's crossed. <laughs> Someone circling old leopard tracks. Those are from a day or two ago. trees here and so we're going to check very very carefully through here come on Dave spot me a leopard now crystal's wondering have there been any sightings of Nkanyeni's older daughter uh, at the moment in the area uh, she hasn't been seen for many months crystal I'm pretty sure she's probably moved into the Kruger or into the Manuleti we don't we don't really see her at all
can see I'm going really slowly, checking very carefully every termitaria, every tree, every bare patch of soil. Ideal leopard country here, around a couple of little river systems. See that wonderful afternoon, that African golden light. Now let's hope we can put Karula and the cubs in the golden light. Lynn says, a very valid point, not to forget to look behind us once in a while. No, there's no leopard behind us, Lynn. Now, strangely enough, I have found lots of leopards due to strange little alarm calls, including tiny little birds. I can hear waxbill alarm calls. I'm just going to keep really quiet and look carefully and listen for a few seconds. Yeah, those alarm calls. I'm just gonna put my head over that termite mound. Dave's putting the camera on. Just wear my binoculars. Because they could be moving. Just some dwarf mongoose running away. So, the problem with little bird alarm calls is sometimes being little, you're scared of little things. So it could have quite easily been an alarm calling at a slender mongoose or something, but it's always worth having a check. listening to the game drive.
checking very, very carefully. I'm going to head back towards the Moati River now and see if we can check around there. So there's tracks of her and the cubs, but in this really, really after the rain, these roads are really hard. And makes it a bit difficult. That's why we're going so slowly. She could be anywhere really close to us at the moment. And don't worry, we are remembering to check behind us every now and then. Elise is wondering how do you differentiate between a normal call of a bird and an alarm call? Oh, it's actually, if you spend a lot of time in the bush, it's actually not that difficult. And different birds have different alarm calls, which is different from their calling voice. So the, those beautiful little wax balls normally have a tee tee. It's very difficult to tee tee. When they're not alarming, when they're alarming, it's more of a tee tee. More irritating, actually. So the more irritating a bird call, it's generally an alarm call. Franklin, da, 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 and that's an alarm call. And although Franklin can be quite irritating uh, a lot of the time. I'm just going to check there's some nice trees here. I think I'm going to go for a walk if we don't get any luck in the next little while. The Moati River system is just below here, but there's no access at this point. No easy access, let's say. There's always access, sometimes. Herbert tracks. Ah, so Taxon is doing what I had planned to do. Uh, he's driving down into the Moati, so we're not going to go in there. I think I'm going to go for a walk from here. And the last tracks we're heading into this area here. Keep quiet for a second, see if we can hear anything. No alarm calls. So I think I'm going to take a stroll on last tracks. That's probably going to be our best chance to find them. Uh, I really think she's probably taking them back towards a kill. So while we do that, Um, I'm just going to listen for a little bit longer. Now, as I said, it can be the tiniest little noise that can give away a leopard or a lion's presence. So I'm going to go take a walk in here. Fingers crossed we find Queen Karula on a kill. While we do that, uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. I've also been off on foot trying to work out where on earth these lions have gone. And it's become incredibly windy out here. Oh, here's half of the population of the Impala on Arethusa. Hello, guys. They're all looking very relaxed and not looking at all like lions came marching through here. 
However, I've decided that my best approach in order to find these lions, if they haven't gone to Simbombili, which I'm starting to suspect might actually be the case, I think they might have crossed and then walked back across just a little bit to the north of where they were. But I'm thinking if they haven't done that, then they might well have decided to go across towards Red Dam. Now that's going to be my next port of call, is to go and check around there. And of course, look for all kinds of other creatures that we might see out here in the African bush. Sorry, I just actually had to get out of the car ever so quickly. But I'm now back on and attempting to unfold and untangle my earpiece. Already, the Impala are looking cold. They started getting that deep red color that they get whenever their coats are puffed up. Uh, they're starting to feel the wind effect. It is blowing. I'm surprised at this wind. It just feels as though it came out of nowhere and all of a sudden it's really gusting. And that, of course, is also bound to make all of the animals out here a little bit more on edge. But let's go investigate. Let's see how the rain topped up, or if the rain topped up Red Dam, because apparently they had lots and lots of rain here on Arethusa. Let's go see what's happening there, and whether or not our hippo friend is still around, and whether or not the lions have decided to come across there for a drink. I just don't think it's likely, because there's so many puddles in the, in the surrounding vegetation that they could just go and lap up some water from. I don't think they would go out of their way to go to this water hole. And they wouldn't even do it in order to hunt because all of the other animals are going to be adopting a similar approach, which is to just go and drink at the puddles rather than the water holes. Now for the predators, whilst we enjoy the rain and we rejoice to have the rain around us, it does make their lives a little bit more difficult. Speaking of our recent rain, a cat in Tampa, I'm afraid none of the wildflowers have popped up just yet after the rain. So cat, we're probably going to have to wait until about November because it's not, their growth is not just based on water, it's also based on the time of year. And most of the plants, most of the wildflowers that we see are perennial plants, which means they sort of grow and bloom about once a year, but then they just go underneath the ground and they remain dormant with their rhizomes underneath the surface of the soil. So they're around, they're just hiding from us at the moment. So I haven't seen any wildflowers around me, but if I do see any cat, I promise I will stop and show them to you. The one wintering flower that we get out here is the narrow-leaved calantia, which I will have a look for. Most of the wildflowers are summer species, but the narrow-leaved calantia is one of the few winter flowering plants. And then there is a, a plant called an impala lily. Now, we don't get them in this particular part of the Sabi sand. I certainly haven't encounter any, encountered any wild growing impala lilies. We have one, Brent and myself have one, which is really, truly beautiful. It blooms these bright pink flowers that are absolutely stunning. But that is not a plant that they much prefer the sort of rockier areas, and not one that we see around here. Hello Red Dam. Let's see how much water is in here. Lots of water. Lots of water. This is probably the most water I've ever seen in Red Dam. Or it feels like it is. Even a year ago when I first started working here, I don't think there was this much dam in Red Dam. Looking lovely. Unfortunately, it is also looking almost entirely devoid of life. There's no hippo hiding in his usual corner. There's one blacksmith lapwing wandering around the water's edge. And that is that, unfortunately. Otherwise, all quiet at Red Dam. We'll have to wait another few days before the water holes become active once again. Hoping to have a quick drink and pick up whatever fresh water mollusk I can find. Oh, 
Our car is gently rolling forward um, down into the dam. It's okay, Wendy. Please, please try and stay where you are. Finn, who is eight years old, I hope you're having a wonderful safari this afternoon. Finn wants to know where, where all our monkeys have gone. Are they hiding away when it's cold or do they go away when it's cold? Finn, we just haven't... Actually, I don't think Brent nor myself have checked. What's happening? Sorry, Finn. Bear with me a moment. Right. <laughs> oh, there's a leopard. There's a leopard there. That's why they went crazy. Can you believe it? <laughs> oh, shame, he's got a limp. Who is this? Oh, no wonder the lapwings got so cross. A male leopard has just come down to the water's edge to drink while we're sitting here. Okay, I take it back. I take it back. Red Dam is not devoid of animal life. I was entirely wrong. Okay, so who have we got here? Somebody with quite an uncomfortable looking limp. Could this be Tingana? It looks like it might be. I haven't seen him in absolute ages. Well, that was an entirely pleasant surprise, wasn't it? <laughs> what a way for things to change. <laughs> okay. Let's um, watch him drink from this position. The reason I say, no, we can go a little bit further down so that we can change our angle slightly. Sorry, Finn, we got interrupted by a leopard. I'll tell you about monkeys a little bit later. Wow. Okay, so we're going to go down here. Oh, we almost went into the water's edge. And we're just going to watch him. I don't want to go too much further because I don't know where he's going to go. And it's a very, very tricky position for us to try and follow him. Wendy, would you please stay still? Sorry, that's not Jandre's camera work. It's Wendy attempting to launch us into the dam. No wonder the lapwings were so cross. Hello, gorgeous. Where have you been hiding? Dive bombing him. I think he's going to decide not to get his feet wet. I think he's going to go back up the bank where he came from. Yeah. Please don't go over the back there, because I have no idea how we'll follow you. Thank you. Thank you, good boy. That's a good boy. Ah, oh, beautiful. Shame, and the poor lapwing parents are fuming that he is here. This is incredible. Who are you? And wanting some more to drink, he just did a very quick hop over. This is Tingana, isn't it? Am I going crazy? I need him to just turn his head ever so slightly. It feels like I've been so long since I've teen seen Tingana. And the blacksmith lapwings are taking every thought out of my head. Our station's one Madora Ingwe Red Dam. I have no idea if anybody heard me, but I did try. This is absolutely awesome. Hello, boy. Doesn't look like Mvula, does it? It could be him. He looks a bit small for Tingana, but his ears don't look tatty enough for Mvula. I just want to double check. Okay, let's wait and see. Let's wait until we get he gets a little bit closer. He's clearly very thirsty. Those eyes to me look sort of mvula like. But the ears don't look right. Hello, big boy. See the limp? He's not a very comfortable leopard. Something has happened to him. Oh, there they go back furious that this leopard is here. It's not mvula. I think this is one hungry looking. Is this Tingana? 
I think Tingana too. Okay, he's going right behind the vehicle, as you can see. Let's wait for him to be a comfortable distance. Oh, we're about to go into the water. Hold on, everybody. I think Tingana. That's my conclusion. So, welcome everybody on a live safari experience, and this is why. Yeah, he's marking his territory, it's definitely. This is why these live safaris are so incredibly exciting, because sometimes you just get these moments with a leopard walking into the sunset that have taken you so by surprise that you just can't begin to believe it. Absolutely awesome. Shame, he's got a very nasty limb. Okay, we're just going to reposition slightly. Oh, Bushbuck just saw him. There's a deep barking sound. That's what's attracted his attention. Mid um, squat. You were such a nice surprise. Okay, going into the drainage system. Oh, I don't have my box with me, so I don't have my leopard scat collecting vial. But that's okay, we know exactly where it is, so we can come back and grab it at a later stage. Because we do collect the leopard scat in order to get a DNA result from each individual leopard. Everything's alarm calling here now. He's about to make life very tricky as he goes through here. Oh, unhappy Franklin's chirping from the cesticulars. That's why it's so important to listen to the sounds of the bush. Mm. It's his front right, I think. Tingana had a limp the last time I saw him, but it was not as uncomfortable looking as this is now. And he is looking quite hungry as well. Before anybody gets too stressed out about. So Shamel, you were asking about Tingana having a limp and whether or not this was him. I think it's him and he did have a limp, you're right. But it seems to have got worse since I last saw him. Still not enough to harm his hunting abilities. Stations, if anyone can copy me, I've got one Madura Ingwe now mobile west from Red Dam towards the pump house. Oh, we're in Wendy. We're on Wendy. I think we're going to lose our signal as we go through here. Oh no, um, what to do, what to do, he is marking his territory, it's definitely Tingana by the way, hello boy, oh, we never knew what caused that injury to Tingana's foot or to his leg, we don't know whether it's foot based or leg based, he did have a cut there when he was mating with Tundi and that was months ago, that was obviously more than three months ago because she's since had cubs. Urine scent marking, so spraying his urine, making sure every leopard in this area knows that he is around and about. I still can't believe that happened. <laughs> Sitting there at a dam. He's right here. For now, Tingana is doing, being incredibly kind to us and taking us on a road. Okay, let me just reposition quickly. That leads us through a drainage line. Yay, Tingana, after so long. I f it feels like forever since I last saw him. You can hear all of the cesticulars going crazy. Oh, 
Oh, this is the way that a truly wonderful afternoon goes. Just, we always talk about how we never plan anything. This is exactly why. Oh, no, don't go up that way. Oh, no. Oh, dear. That's not good. I was hoping he would stick in the drainage line. But he is now going off the road and up into an area that no matter one's driving skill, it's going to be incredibly tricky to stay with him. I can still see him. He stopped there to send Mark. No, no, go right. The other right. That's not right. Oh dear. Oh wait, hold on, he's sitting down. Yeah. He's sitting down. Oh. Okay. Let's try and get a view of him from here. Perhaps we will be able to get the vehicle up. Oof. sitting, surveying the bush around him. Now, there is a very, very good chance, if he continues further into this block, that we could lose signal. Oh, it's hugely unfortunate. I'm really hoping it isn't going to happen. But there is that possibility. I have tried called, calling other vehicles into the sighting. Nobody's responded to me. So we have him all to ourselves, and for the moment he has gone, not flat, but he has sat down. I don't think he's going to stay that way. Please don't disappear, boy. This is awesome. I, s I feel as though it's been at least a month since we last saw Tingana. So he is, for new viewers who have joined us in that month period that we haven't seen him, Tingana is the dominant male leopard in the area in which we traverse. So he, probably of all of the male leopards, we spend or used to spend the most time with him. Um, Mvula, at least over the last year, Mvula, who we've been seeing recently, used to be dominant over the sort of eastern portion of Jubal, the eastern half of Juma, and he was pushed out by Tingana moving into his territory. And Tingana's absolutely enormous. Uh, standing by. I'm trying to stay with him. He's now moving south into the block. Um, just sort of between the pump house and that scorva. Copy that. You're more than welcome, Shanae. Okay, so Shanae's going to try and come and join us. We're going to try and keep up with him. Unfortunately, he is making life very difficult. Obviously, I can't, I can't go in there with the vehicle. There's no way on earth I'm going to manage that. And we're going to try. The only thing I can suggest is for us to go around and hope that he pops out into more of an open area. Sorry, everybody, bumping about on the back. I can't really drive through here either because it's only going to make the erosion here ten times worse. So where has he gone? Ooh. If we go further in here, I think we're going to lose our signal, but we'll try. We'll give it a go. Cross fingers, everybody. Okay, we couldn't, we can go off here. Hold on. You got him. Got him, thank you. Chandra, that's nine on most watches. <laughs> well done, though. 
Well spotted, yeah, left and right. He is absolutely there. We've got a big log to get over, so hold on. Oh, goodness. Oh. I hope there's no stumps. Please let there be no stumps, no stumps, no stumps, no stumps. Such a stunning view. And James Dungan, it's an interesting question. So James has asked, can a leopard get arthritis? I've read up about it. Oops, sorry. I have read up about it. It does seem as though it is a possibility, but it's something that usually only occurs in really, really old individuals and potentially in captive bred individuals. So in other words, animals that don't get the exercise that they might otherwise in the wild. That, did did Tingana have that scar when we last saw him? I don't remember that. He is on the hunt, he's very empty bellied. That flap of skin is starting to show between his back legs. Okay. And he is intent and alert. He's looking to hunt something. He's looking to eat. And I think something's attracted his attention off in the Tamboiti thickets. I just want to watch his behavior because he's listening. He's not actively hunting just yet. He's listening. Okay. He's decided he's going to keep moving. We'd know instantly if he was stalking. It would be very clear in his body language. Hey guys, unfortunately my comms are getting really, really tricky to try and hear your questions, so I'm not ignoring you, I promise. And Deborah, armchair traveller, I know that you have asked a question. I do also just have to listen for Shanae to try and guide her into the sighting, because it's going to be really difficult. As he starts to move into one of the most difficult blocks Okay. Oh, he saw something. Did he go for it? Did he catch it? No. I think it might have been a Franklin or something similar. We can't follow him through the Tamboiti thicket. We've just got to hope he's coming back towards the drainage line. He's dashing and ducking in here. Sorry, Jandre. Well done, Jandre. Bravo, Jandre. There's a branch very much aimed at Jandre. <laughs> he ducked down here. Where is he gone? There he goes. He's going to pop out here. Shanae for Jamie. What's your position? Okay, copy. I'm going to try and stay with him at the moment. He's on the southern side of that drainage that runs between Red Dam and Buff Skull. I'll try and keep with him. Now, while we have been watching the dominant male leopard of this area, Brent has been very busy searching for other little spotted cats. Let us go and find if he has any has had any success.
So after some serious tracking, I uh, actually managed to find both of Karula's little, look, look, there we go, playing. Uh, Karula's little cubs and Karula herself, the queen. And times are good for the queen and her cubs at the moment. And times are great for us because, as you saw, just up in the top corner, Look at that. Oh, it's an, it's an adult female impala. And there's a cub on the way up the tree towards it. And you see the tree moving. Now, it is quite late, so we're not going to stay very long. But the difference now between most of the kills we found, and not there's Queen Karula, is that this isn't a tree. So it's safe from hyenas, it's safe from lions. Oh, look up at the cub. The cub's made its way to the carcass. Oh, look at that. Yum, 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 impala for dinner. I'm not really interested in, in eating, more interested in playing. And you can see how intact that carcass is. <laughs> Look at that. So of course Dave's going to do some camera magic to make it lighter. We're not going to put any lights of course, but isn't this absolutely splendid? But the cubs are, seem to be more interested in playing than feeding. Uh, the other cub is a little bit lower in the tree. It looks like Queen Karula might actually... No, she's sniffing around at the base. There we go. The times are good for Queen Karula. There she is, to the right. There we go. She might go up the tree. Oh, looks like she's eaten quite a bit already. Probably the liver, the lungs. Some of the rump from what I could see. <laughs> Look, it's practicing attacking Impala rather than eating them at the moment. That's a wonderful spot for us that she's put it in. A very beautiful part of Juma here in the Mawati River. So we actually found her on foot, Herbie and myself. Herbie was following the tracks and then I walked up ahead of him a little bit and I managed to spot a Karula actually in the tree watching me. And probably from a, almost about where we're sitting right now is where I saw her. She just watched me and I walked back, I told Herbert, and we rushed back to the car to get here before dark. It's so incredible spending time with these young animals as they grow up and you can watch them hone and develop their skills. So a lot of their skills are instinctive, but practice makes perfect. So Mike in Florida is saying, geez, they grow fast. How much weight do they pick up every week? Well, Mike, I kind of, I'm afraid I can't answer that exactly. But they do grow incredibly fast. These guys were born on the 2nd of February. So March, April, May, June, July. So they are, including February, about just under six months old. 
2nd of February will be their 6th month. I mean, 2nd of August will be their 6th month birthday. Oh, now there's the other cub who's just playing with a very old... Oh no, it's a piece of fluff from the Impala. That's dropped. And just, again, rather keeping itself entertained rather than eating anything. I don't imagine there's too much meat on there. <laughs> like a cat with a fluffy toy. Oh, watching sibling up at up the top in the tree. Oh, a big impala like this, that's going to give us some really great sightings over the next few days. The only thing that might steal it from them is another male leopard. And Jamie's just had Tingana and Arethusa. I'm not sure which way he was going, but I think they should be fine. Isn't that just too cute? Oh well, we're gonna sit here with these cubs for as long as possible, but Jamie's got one last visual of Tingana. Oh, guys, the leopard is very much on the move and I don't want to risk you guys missing out on seeing him. Slowly moving through this drainage system. We've managed to stay with him. What an incredible afternoon. Leopard cubs with a kill. Tingana we haven't seen it in ages. So there's a very, very good chance that we are going to miss out or not miss out, but not manage to stay with him for the rest of the sunset safari. I'm also trying to direct other people into the sighting. Uh, they are coming to join us. and We're not going to keep you away from those cubs for too long. He has spotted something. Okay, let's keep going, let's keep going. And try and stick with him. Guys, I just want to check something at the same time as doing this, which is, have I given everybody the right direction? I'm pretty sure I have, but I'm just double checking. See, he's very much looking to hunt. Yeah, no, this is absolutely right. I did give the right directions. Phew. Awesome. Such a wonderful sighting. All right, but we don't want to keep you away from another awesome sighting, so we're going to send you back across to Brent and those cubs. Right. Okay, so the one cub's come down. Oh, the other cub's just jumped up on there. There we go. So, as I said, we're not going to put any light. If it looks like there's light in there, it's Dave doing some camera magic. As I said, the reason we're staying here a little bit later than we did yesterday, number one is mom's here, number two, the killer's in the tree, and they're mostly in the tree, which makes it much, much safer for them. So that's why we're here in this slightly darker than we would normally stay with these little leopards. And they're getting big so quickly. <laughs> it's not even attacking the impala, it's attacking the branch. Now, mom is just sleeping at the base of the tree. We can't see her from here. But 
we're going to have some very nice leopard sighting over the next two or three days. Although two growing cubs like that, maybe not three days, maybe only two days before it's finished. that just beautiful. Now it looks like a bit more serious feeding rather than playing. Getting stuck in. I'm keeping eye out for the other sibling in case it decides to come join, but not yet. special to be able to be here. I guess we're going to be able to stay here for maybe another six or so minutes before we go beyond the camera's capabilities. But while we can, we're going to enjoy this. And I guarantee you, I'm going to be here first thing tomorrow morning. So Tula Ann, who's four years old, would like to know, how do those little cats stay in the tree with that animal? Well, like if you've got a kitty at home, Tula Ann, they've got very sharp claws uh, that help them hang on to the branches and the bark. And how the animal got into the tree is mom actually caught that animal and put it up in the tree so it's safe from hyenas. Just listening. I'm just trying to see if we can see anything. I don't think we're going to get any better visuals. The light's disappearing. So while we make our way out of here, let's go see how Jamie is doing with Tingana. Linking. Guys, this is going to be the last few moments that we have to spend with Tingana. Now I brought Sinead into the sighting so her guests are having a chance to go ahead of us. But as I said, this is going to be the last few moments that we spend with him. I just want to get you across, not keep you away for too long. I also can't hear a thing Rebecca's telling me, so we may not live. But I'm pretty sure we are. There he goes. And there we go, the last few moments with a Tingana. And as he goes off, we're going to pull out and make room for other vehicles coming into the sighting, especially because I can't hear. So I have no idea if we're live. Oh, oh. hey, I can hear you. <laughs> hey, Rebecca. <laughs> All right, so our last few moments with Tingana, we're going to pull out and let the other vehicles have some time with him. In the meantime, I'm going to send you back across to Brent. Well, you get to join us for some creative driving. Now, getting in here was quite interesting. And now, getting out of here in the dark is going to be even more interesting. So, if it looks like we're going to roll over, we're not, don't worry. We've been doing this for a few years. And these little vehicles are incredibly capable. You can watch, I'm about to go. Ooh. We can take them to about 45 degrees without rolling over. That wasn't even 20. No stress. Uh, getting out of the drainage line, however, could be a little bit more difficult. 
might need to get some, some speed to climb the steep bank. That's where we came down. I don't think we're getting, oh, sorry, scrub hair. Disappearing, there it is. Um, we came down here, getting up might be a bit interesting. Well, let's have a look, what do you think? Do you think we can do it, Dave? Dave thinks we can do it. So I just need to change my angle of approach to go up. Oh, it's not that bad, I think we've done worse. Now, the one thing that might happen now is we might lose a cameraman because there's quite a thorny patch ahead. Hold on, guys! Whee! Oh, didn't even have to go into first gear. Okay, so you can see this is some of the more fanciful driving we get to do. Now, yeah, we next spot, we're on a steep, steep incline, but, oh, did we catch a tree? I think we caught a tree there. But on a steep, steep incline, but that's not the problem. The incline isn't the problem. It's the thorn trees on either side at the top of the incline. And there's some very big ones on that. So you got big, long, straight on the brack thorn on the left, and then you got hooked and nasty on the knob thorn on the right. I think we should be able to get through. And we'll try to at least. Okay. Try to keep the cameras clear as well. So we don't mind impaling ourselves like that or our camera operators, but we look after the equipment. <laughs> There's quite a strange sight behind me. There you have Dave who has a five litre water bottle that he's using to fend off the thorns. Quite successfully, I think. Uh, the only thing that could have made that better is if the thorn had punctured the water bottle and sprayed all over him. But that was quite clever, Dad. Okay. So, you're gonna keep with us. As you can see, during the day it's bad, but at night, it's even more difficult. Uh, but fortunately, we're out of the worst of it. So there's actually a little sightings road or a little two-track road in here. Um, many moons ago, uh, we had quarantine with a kill in one of these big jackalberries here. There, that one over there. Well, that was quite a long time ago. So we knew how to get into this area from that particular sighting. We actually found Karula on foot in this area quite a few times, but she's been on the move. Yeah, we're nearly out. I'm back onto the road. So the afternoon started off a bit slow on the big cat front. But fortunately, it came true towards the end and even better. Uh, for the first time in quite a long time, we've got a stable leopard sighting in a tree. And it's not just a stable leopard sighting. It's a stable leopard and cub sighting. I can't help but that. I'm going to look forward to spending a, some glorious hours with those wonderful little creatures over the next while, while they devour that adult female impala. Aha! Back onto well, semi-solid ground, the main road. There is my spotting device, there it is. Of course it's caught in a radio. Always caught in a radio. But there we go. Okay. Now I wonder what other wonders we can find in the last 10 minutes. Uh, I just can't get over how awesome it's going to be for the next couple of safaris having Karula and the cubs on an we just say it again, adult female impala. Well done, mom, for lifting that heavy thing in the tree. Now, she, where she is, is almost halfway between 
chele pan, which has got some water in it, and the juma pan. So it's going to be interesting to see which way she goes for a drink, because uh, they will go for a drink after eating quite a lot of meat, and I feel she's probably going to come this way. I think chele pan's a little bit closer. And also, probably not so surrounded by grumpy old buffalo bulls. Oh, it seems like everyone's very, very happy that we got to see four leopards today. That's our most leopards in a day for quite some time. We've done a few twos, the old three, but not too often do we get four leopards in a day. Who knows, maybe tomorrow we can do five. My record, my personal best in 24 hours, uh, was for a film crew a long time ago. Um, and I was guiding the film crew and they had a, a quite an entertaining host a crazy American guy from LA. Okay, so there's Herbie's car. Herbie came with us to have a look at the leopard, so I'm saying bye, Herb. Bye. There you go, bye, Herb. Thank you very much. No problem. So Herbie was helping us track. Um, okay. Okay, so as I was saying, my personal best with leopards in a 24-hour period uh, was uh, Renius, who's come up to improve our tracking skills, and myself were working as a team. And I'm just trying to remember, we had, we, in 24 hours, we saw 26 different leopards. Uh, we tracked and found all of them. We did hit some luck. Uh, the one, we had a male, a female, and three cubs in one sighting. So we did have a couple of cub sightings that pushed the numbers up. But my personal best, and that was not and not looking for leopards. I was moving a vehicle that had come into town in Botswana to get fixed and it had to get back to our camp in the bush. And it's about 225 kilometers, but it takes you about nine and a half hours due to how thick the sand is and how bad the roads are. And in that nine hour drive, I saw seven different leopards. And so, uh, Juma, I'm trying to think what's my best leopards in a, in a day. Probably five, four, four. It's four, actually. It's four in one drive. Not in a day, in one drive is four. Um, and it was Mvula, Karula, Quarantine, and Kunyuma all in the same sighting. Maybe some of our long time while there viewers can tell us what is the most leopards ever seen on a single drive. Uh, that, well, I'd really love to know that little tidbit of information and maybe we can work our way to changing it, you know, improving on it. What is the most leopard seen in a single drive for our long time viewers? Maybe someone can let me know uh, and you can do that hashtag Safari Live as I'm sure our long time viewers know or questions at wildearth.tv. What an amazing sunset safari, the glorious African sky ahead, leopards in the bank for tomorrow morning. I think I have uh, earned, well, we've earned our apple juice this evening. Now, wouldn't it be nice to finish off with a nice little nocturnal predator? So we're going to make our way back towards camp and on the way we're going to check for any nocturnal critters, bush babies, uh, white-tailed mongoose and the like. But from Dangerous Dave, the dish.
And myself, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the back of the vehicle with us on this Sunset Safari. And I am absolutely thrilled to take you on another safari. Uh, bright and early tomorrow, just after sunrise. Uh, but till then, let's see how Jamie's endeavours in the western sectors are going. Well, it wasn't the lions we set out to find, but I feel as though our endeavours in the west went really well. There is, there is a certain joy in um, tracking down and finding an animal and spending time, investing that time and searching for them. But those wonderful surprise moments are also to me something really really truly special when you're not expecting it where you're just sort of bumbling along and you think about when you look back at them later you think about how perfect your timing would have had to have been because in this soil I probably wouldn't have seen his tracks walking up along the dam and down to where they went I definitely would have seen them in the drainage line but would I have gone that way probably not if we found the lions, we wouldn't have found Tingana. Now it just goes to show how these small little matters of chance start to rack up and change the way that your day goes completely. I, for one, am thrilled that we finally got to see Tingana. It does really, really feel like a long time since we've seen him. And he will be heading out tonight looking to hunt. Of course, he's remarking his territory because the rains came down and washed all of his urine markings away. So he is doing a sort of a re, what's the word, a patrol, actually, just a patrol of his territorial boundaries to make sure that his markings stay fresh and up to date. It's essentially like updating his Facebook status, but a lot more important and profound in his life. A really, truly a lovely afternoon. As Brent says, it started off quiet, but it certainly then took off with something of a bang. And you know, who knows, we've got another two minutes. We could definitely see the lions in that time. My hopes are high now. I feel as though I'm riding very high. I wish I could show you these mountains and I don't think we're gonna to get to a view spot in time, unfortunately. It's so beautiful. The sunset is really, really stunning. But we just, we're not going to be able to get to a nice open patch in a time. Oh no, no, I've changed my tune. We are going to get to a nice open spot. We've got two minutes. We can definitely do this. Hold on, everybody. Hold on, Charles. This is going to be bumpy. We could definitely get to this viewpoint. We have got... There you go, Haley. We've had so many leopards this afternoon, but you wanted a sunset as well. And I think we can... Oh, whoops, no, we can't. There's uh, people there. Hello. Sorry. Sorry. No sunset for us. <laughs> we could try one from here. A little bit back, I can. Yeah. Here we go. For Haley. There you go. A sunset for you. With the mountains just poking out over the back. Beautiful. What a lovely way to finish off what has been a truly stunning and surprising afternoon. So, on behalf of myself and the entire Wild Earth team, we'd like to say a very big thank you to you all for joining us. A big thank you to jean -Dre for his fantastic camera work, and he truly did get some amazing shots of Tingana as he wandered through that beautiful setting. And a big thank you to Rebecca and to Jerry in a final control. I've just realized Chelsea's sitting on the back, so it has to be Jerry. And most importantly, as I said, I'd like to extend our thanks from all of us here at Wild Earth for joining us, for sending us through your questions and your comments, for sticking with us whenever the gremlins attack, and for having patience to wait for those wonderful moments when the wild animals just kind of pull it out of the bag. Definitely been a fantastic afternoon. So we will try and match that tomorrow for the sunrise safari. In the meantime, farewell and have a wonderful day.